This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association. Want to get discounts on homebrew supplies and save money at craft breweries? Join the American Homebrewers Association and save at more than 2,300 AHA member deal locations worldwide and online. Members enjoy discounts on pints, food, and merch, and 10 to 30% off on online orders. My local homebrew shop, for instance, offers a 10% discount for AHA members. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to check out the AHA member deals in your area and join the AHA. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to join the American Homebrewers Association to access thousands of members-only discounts. homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, February 2nd, 2023. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin and I formulate a recipe for an Italian Pilsner, a hopefully tasty dry hop version of the classic German style. We also taste Matt's Triple, which we formulated on this show a few episodes back. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. If you want to support us financially, and why wouldn't you, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters have already seen the uh, video episode that Steve and I did on our winter ales. I sent it out to uh, financial supporters last week. Uh, Those beers started off as holiday ales, but, you know, here we are in the new year. So they're winter ales. (laughs) Chris Colby and I formulated the recipe for mine on uh, this show a while back. And Steve's is based on a, a double recipe. Both of them are pretty tasty. Financial supporters got recipes for both, along with a behind-the-scenes video of my brewing the uh, holiday-slash-winter ale. Again, many thanks to everybody who's going above and beyond to help this uh, thing keep on going. Steve and I recorded an interview this past weekend at Boston Mountain Brewing and Supply, uh, North Tunnel Homebrew Supply, which used to be Steve's Brew Shop, which used to be the Home Brewery, has merged with Boston Mountain Brewing in Fayetteville, Arkansas, to create the new business. Uh, Steve and I chatted with Daniel Stubblefield, who purchased Steve's Brew Shop along with his wife, Paige. Matt Thompson of Boston Mountain Brewing uh, joined us for the conversation. If you remember, in the archives, we talked to him about three and a half years ago when his brewery first opened. Uh, We all sat together and sampled some tasty beers there at the bar, And uh, you'll hear that conversation next week. We had a great time, Steve and I. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of the synergy between the two businesses. Steve and I are uh, set to enjoy a bunch of craft beers from around the uh, the region this coming Saturday as we're planning to attend Frost Fest in Fayetteville. It's sold out. So if you've already got a ticket, I hope to see you there. The weather has been icy all this week. Uh, but it's supposed to clear off and be around 50 degrees or uh, Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius on uh, Saturday. So uh, I'm going to wear my muck boots in case the uh, Washington, uh, Washington County Fairgrounds are, are sloppy. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Uh, and we'll be recording a lot of interviews for this show. It's supposed to be windy on Saturday. So uh, an update on my lager beers. I'm planning to keg my Vienna lager today. I haven't tasted it yet or taken a gravity reading, but the fermentation looks great, and it's settling out nicely. It was ready for the diacetyl rest just as I brewed my Italian Pilsner, so I put the Pilsner into the kegerator to ferment after I took the Vienna lager out. Uh, In the interview that you're about to hear, I said that I planned to ferment in the basement, but the uh, snow put a pause on my brewing plans, but it all worked out. Uh, I plan to dry hop the Pilsner today. Its diastole rest uh, should be about done. I'm really looking to, uh, forward to both of those beers. I got called out on uh, Instagram for – for I posted a picture of the Vienna lager in the kegerator, and somebody said, aha, you're finally using uh, you know fermentation control or something like that. I was like, well, 
uh, the, the kegerator was empty. It was available. But the basement is just is right at the temperature that I set on the kegerator. So, you know, it's six and one half dozen the other. Uh, I fermented both of those lagers with the seasonal yeast from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast, L25 Huga. That's H-Y-G-G-E, is a northern European lager yeast famously used in Pilsner styles that complement significant hop additions. That'd be perfect for this beer, this Italian Pilsner. Clean and crisp with a very light sulfur profile. Both of these beers, the uh, winter lager and the, or the, uh, or the uh, rather the uh, Vienna lager and the, <laughs> And the, I'm talking about too many beers. The Vienna Lager and the uh, Italian Pilsner, both of them weighed in at around 1050. And I didn't use a starter. I didn't have to dust off my stir plate. Uh, those 200 billion cells in each package of Huga went right to work. Uh, they weren't bubbling before bedtime, as in ales, but by breakfast, the fermentation was well up and running. Now, should I have used a starter for the benefit of flavor and character of the beer? We will see, and I will keep you posted. But from all appearances, L25 Huga was very happy at around 57 degrees Fahrenheit or 14 C without a starter in these moderate gravity five-gallon batches. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> Stay tuned. But that's 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 how it went around here. Stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, ask your local homebrew store about L25 Huga from Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Okay, let's get with Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin to formulate my Italian Pilsner and to taste his delicious triple. Matt Giovanisi, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me again. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. I know. You like your triples, huh? <laughs> I do. <laughs> and you sent me a, two big old bottles, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a wasted afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I'm, I'm very excited. So remind us, uh, we got together uh, a few weeks ago. I don't remember when, but to, to formulate this recipe for a triple, mm -hmm. what were you shooting for? And talk about the recipe. Uh, so the recipe that we developed was very simple. We went with um, a Belgian pills. That was kind of the only uh, that and, and aromatic malt and some flaked wheat. And then we added for the additional sugar charges. Well, we added uh, a pound of uh, Belgian candy syrup, like the lightest one mm -hmm. uh, and and honey, a pound of honey as oh, well. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then this is just saws hops, uh, you know, a little bit at the beginning of the boil, a little bit at the end of the boil. And then, um, you know, uh, water chemistry was balanced, you know, nothing crazy there. Uh, followed the, you know, BJCP guidelines for a Belgian triple. Um, there was one, and, and, you know, we, I, this one, I, I did a beta rest at 48, uh, 148 degrees Fahrenheit. And then a, uh, alpha rest at 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. So I did a uh, step mash and the only, uh, trouble that I ran into with this particular recipe was that I couldn't get the original yeast that we wanted to use. Ah, okay. Um, we originally said that we wanted to use triple double, which I believe is the Chimay strain. Hmm. Uh, from what I was told from the homebrew store, um, and I don't know if this is true, but they are no, but Imperial is no longer carrying that strain or oh. they just couldn't get it. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, I also couldn't get it on the internet. So, um, I had to go with monostatic. Right, is that how you say it? <laughs> monostat? <laughs> that sounds like something you, sounds like a salve or, or an ointment. No, yeah, no. Uh, was it monastic? Monastic. monastic <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. I'll cut that out if you want. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah, so uh, monastic. <laughs> Yeah, monostat is something that you. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 totally, totally. No, there wasn't seven. It was uh, just one. Um, so I, 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 <laughs> I found that at the local homebrew store, uh, monostatic, <laughs> or monastic, <laughs> or monastic, whatever you prefer. Um, and I, I pitched two packets of it. Um, oh, okay. I, it, it was a vigorous fermentation. <laughs> I had a couple of cleanups. 
Uh, like so, and this was like, I had it. Uh, I pitched at 65 degrees Fahrenheit, so I pitched pretty cool, and I let it free rise to 75 degrees mm-hmm. um, after a, a two or three days at 65, or I just kind of like slowly cr- uh, creeped it up over that period of time. Um, but man, I, yeah, there was one day I went out into the brewery and had to clean up, like mop up a puddle. Uh, and I have a, and this was with a blow off cane, by the way. So it was so vigorous. Um, and it was, this and a, was this a 10 gallon batch? This was a five gallon batch. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. I, 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 I think I had, I think I, I, I overfilled like I, uh, in my process, I had a little more than I normally do. I, sh- I usually shoot for five and a half gallons. I think I had six gallons in there and I was like, oh, it's okay. And then, uh, pitch two packets, uh, you know, put oxygen in it, you know, tried to do, I, I had, uh, you know, I used a, a yeast nutrient. Like I just wanted this to be a super clean fermentation. And I actually, uh, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll taste it. I regret that decision mm. actually. Mm. Um, I think I could have gotten away and I did a starter with both of those packets. So I, I, oh, I was ensuring super healthy fermentation, which is what I got. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that that, that over, uh, the over correction of healthy fermentation actually led to a pretty, uh, a not as a, not as much Belgian character as I want it. Mm. And I, and that's, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll taste it and we'll see, but like, I was, yeah, that, I would have uh, not pitched as much, actually. I probably would have went, you know, with one. And again, it was like a 9% beer, so I was, I was, uh, you know, doing my due diligence, I thought. It was but bel- I think belt and suspenders. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open it up. Yeah, I'm going to do the same. This is a uh, 750 milliliter bottle. Yep. Uh-huh. And I did, two, uh, I, I bottled half of it and bottled Ooh. conditioned half of it and, uh, Keg the other half. We got a hiss. I got a hiss. Yep. We, we've got we've got foam. Yep. It There's smells bed. great. I haven't even put the bottle or the uh, glass up to my to my nose yet. And it's, it sm- as soon as I pop the yeah. uh, the cap, uh, pop the cap. That's, I'm all gangster with my <laughs> beer. <laughs> as soon as I cracked it open, I smelled it. Boy, that's a beautiful beer. It's it's a bit cloudy. Yep. Uh, but, and, it, and it wasn't. Until I chilled it. So I so these bottles, mm. uh, they had to bottle condition for about a month uh, because after two weeks, which is, I think, pretty normal, I got zero carbonation out of them. Uh, Nothing. And I use those Cooper tabs or whatever those, you know, sugar. Carbon, carbonation sugar, drops, the ones that carbonation look like little drops. hard candies. Yep. yep. I used two of them in each bottle. Um, and I bottled directly from the primary fermenter. So, I mean, I, there was a lot of yeast in suspension, I believe, because I, I, I didn't let it, you know, it fermented out quick. Uh, so, but it just took, I, I talked to a friend of mine who, who we tasted it and it tasted good. It just wasn't carbonated. He said I would give it some more time, especially with the high alcohol and, and, it, and, it, and eventually, you know, carbonated. But it's not like super, super crispy carbonate, you know, like for mm-hmm. a Belgian style. But yeah, uh, the one I have in the keg is crystal clear. Um, but these were c- clear when I poured them out warm to, 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 ta- uh, to, to test it. And then as soon as I stuck it in the fridge, it, huh, it immediately it clouded up. up. Yeah. Huh. And that could be maybe the flaked wheat that's in the, you know, I, I don't know. Hmm. Oh, that's way good. It's not as, <clears throat> you know, say it's not the belgian beer that right. I've ever had. Right. But it's really good. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I can. T- it is. It, it does taste like a triple to me. Um, it, you know, if I if he were to hand me this glass, mm-hmm. uh, I could I could probably tell you that there's it's got some sugar in it. Yep. Um, it did dry out. It, it dried out at ten ten. Hmm. Which is crazy to me because I mm. checked it twice because I tasted it and couldn't believe it was that dry. It's but it's got it's got a lot of body though. It does, yeah. I mean, it's it it's it's pretty. It tastes chew, chew, pretty chewy. I would not mm-hmm. have thought that it would was that it finished out that low. Frank, yeah, frankly, that's, that was my. You know, I I I tested it with two different hydrometers because I didn't believe it. 
it's not <clears throat> it's not as like crisp as a like a Belgian golden ale, you know, no. uh, like a Duval. Um, it's right. it's kind of softer than that, which which I think you probably want, in, or at least I want in a triple. Mm-hmm. Um, extremely drinkable. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Which yep. It's you may yeah, be the doing wa- most of the talking during the rest of the show. <laughs> yeah, may, uh, the uh, you know if I were to go back and change anything, I mean obviously the the pitching rate I would have I would have dropped it because mm-hmm. I did I do want more Belgian character from it. I probably would have staggered because I I think you had sent me an email from somebody, and I I would have staggered the sugar additions. Huh. I wouldn't have done them at the end of the boil. I would have I would have let it ferment for a few days, you know, without without adding candy syrup or honey. And then I would have added the honey after. Hmm. I think that would have been I think that would have dried it out a little bit more. And I'd probably take out the the flaked wheat. I don't think we really needed it huh. because I think that added a little bit of body. I also think it added to the haze a little bit, the chill haze. Um and I probably would have gone a little higher on the sulfate instead of making it perfectly balanced. I probably would have pushed it more towards uh, a hoppier profile, even though we didn't really have a lot of hops. But mm-hmm. I think that would have made it a little crispier. I think that would have brought out more of the pepper notes that I, I was hoping to get. Because um, I, I really do. I had a, a West Mall. And I, you know, just I bought a bunch of triples and I was just, you know, comparing and I really liked that triple. That was mm. like my favorite. And I'm like, man, it's ta- it has a lot of black pepper notes and it was really kind of like hoppy even like bitter. And I was like, I, I really liked it. And I'm like, oh, I probably would have went more in that direction. This to me is the, a more uh, a more American version, which tends to be sweeter but it's or not. Least, but it's not super sweet, though. No, it's not super sweet, but it has that perceived sweetness. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah. And I do get a little pepper on the nose, though. Yeah, it's there. I it's mean, maybe there. you just put that. But I, I was smelling something, and I was like, "What is that?" And then you said pepper, and it's like, "Oh, it's pepper." That's it. Yeah. And again, I think if we, if I pulled back on the yeast pitching, I would have gotten a lot more Belgiany pepper notes. In fact, I, I get a little bell pepper. Little bell pepper, just a little, just a teeny tiny. There's a maybe it says, huh. "What did I have for lunch?" Let's see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Chipotle. Or... <laughs> no, I had Taco Bell for lunch. <laughs> there's mm. none of that in there. No, there's but, no vegetables. Uh, but I'm getting it. Yeah, just a teeny tiny bit of of like a like a bell pepper kind mm. of a thing, mm. which I think is. I don't think it's a defect. I think it's good. Yeah, uh, but it's just a just a micro. It's not like ooh, you you know. This is yeah. a pepper beer, as in you know, chili beer. Yeah, I get a lot of uh, green pepper aroma when mm-hmm. I drink a an old coffee beer. Oh, hmm. So next time you have like an older coffee beer or any coffee beer, uh, look for look for green bell pepper because oh, I it's, it's once once someone told me that I can't unsmell that now. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Sorry. Now I want to I want to find one. Yeah. Uh, apparently. I, it, Apparently it happens with old coffee beers too. Apparently, Steve and I are going to Frost Fest in mm-hmm. uh, a few weeks, uh, the weekend of uh, February fourth here in Northwest Arkansas. Going to be a bunch of breweries around. Maybe we'll search out a search out a coffee beer. Yeah, um, this is really good. I'm not disappointed. Um, good. Yeah. Do, are you happy with the way? I mean, overall, are you happy? Overall, am I happy? <laughs> General, well, <laughs> with this beer, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, let's, let's let's rein it in a bit. Um, I more specific. <laughs> I'm I'm happy with it, because uh, because everyone else is happy with it. Mm. I think you know it's everyone's like I think you're you know I I tend to be a little more critical. I I've crit- I criticize every beer I make, uh, and as, I just, as you should. Yeah, and I just like how can I do this better next time? I'm constantly thinking that. Um, I also thought to myself, maybe I'm just not a guy who loves triples. I don't drink them a ton. I love Belgian beers, but maybe I just don't drink enough triples to really know. But everyone who's had it has been like, this is awesome. So, yeah. so, uh, so in that case, yes, I'm happy with it, but I do have things I would do it. I would try again. Um, which is the best part of recipe, you know, recipe formulation where, where you start somewhere, you know, create something new. 
And then it's like, okay, that's your that's your baseline. And then you do it better and you get better and you get better. And then eventually you have a, a perfect Belgian triple at some point. Yeah. This is a good – you're well on your way. Uh, yeah. A, uh, yeah, I think when I brew stuff, my biggest problem is not necessarily being overly critical about the beer. It's how does it – compared to what my mind's eye saw when when I was, you know, when we were, you know, coming up with the recipe. Does yeah. it does it match my expectations? And I would say in that case, yes, because of the honey and the candy syrup. I definitely that aromatic malt was an interesting choice. I I do like it. Um somebody also pointed out that we could have went with a uh well, I think we did go uh, a Dingemans is a Belgian pilsner, right? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a, um, there's a teeny bit of bubble gum. Yep. Yep. Or a Wireman's pills, I think, was the one that's uh, well, a lot of the breweries use in Belgium for these styles, I believe. But that's German, right? I, I don't know. So. I think so. <laughs> I'll cut all this somebody. Out. Somebody threw something <laughs> in my head, and I was like, "Oh, but did I use the wrong pills?" I'm like, "I don't think I did. I think I used Belgian pills." Um, but yeah, I I again, I would stagger those sugar additions. Um. And I, yeah, I think the flaked wheat, I don't really need it. And that I think might be giving me, and I, this is just a total guess. I tend to find that when you add wheat to beers, or at least to me, I get this little twang. I get this like little soury twang. Like a lemony kind of a thing? Yeah. And so I think I'm getting that in this beer, and it's not as like crispy, dry as I always imagined a triple to be. But, and especially after drinking that West Mall. But I've had, you know, it's funny. I had the West Mall, and that was really good, like super, super good to me. Um, and what I would want in a triple. And then I had New Belgium's triple. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you. Yeah, and that was. I I I didn't like it because oh. it was really sweet to me, and my friend said, you know, that's Here's... that's a common thing in 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 American Belgian triples. They tend to lean sweeter. There's a lot of spice in there too. Yeah, to me, uh, on my palate, and I like that beer though. Um, but it is it is a, I mean, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but it's de- to me, it's delicious uh, and maybe because I've just been drinking it for so long. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's it, I don't know if you would say it's an Americanized, but because Peter Buchart probably came up with that recipe. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it, it's different from this, let's say. Yeah. And yeah. And I got to say, as the beer is warming up, the it's getting more clear. So that's a, yeah, I guess that's a chill haze. That's uh, yeah. I mean, immediately when I pulled the bottle out and it was warm, I could see through the bottle. Mm-hmm. And then I put it in the fridge and I just note, I opened the fridge one, the next day and I'm like, oh my God, the, all these bottles look cloudy. So that and would kind of, that would kind of make sense that in the keg, I think in the keg, you know, chill haze over time, yeah. uh, you know, has a, has an opportunity to, to clear out a bit. And that dropped pretty quickly, uh, you know, and I, yeah, that one was a little interesting because it, it had been sitting in a bottle bottle conditioning for you know over a month and then it's like immediately put it in the fridge it was like boom there's the chill uh, and it and it's and it's definitely like today as i'm looking at it it is definitely less cloudy than it was even a week ago oh so maybe so <laughs> maybe so time we, in the bottle in the fridge <laughs> i think so yeah absolutely i think if you if i let this sit in the fridge for another month i think we'll be crystal clear Desiree and Dave from High Gravity and Pippin's Tap Room in Tulsa now have a canning line. What's that mean to you? Well, for one thing, it means people are liking their beers because they, they know what they're doing around the brew house. And that means the ingredient kits that you find on HighGravityBrew.com have been tested by actual paying customers. Those recipes have. And Desiree and Dave are able to get feedback to make those beers great. So when you pick up an ingredient kit on HighGravityBrew.com, it's going to be good. Also, since they work with professional brewing gear on a daily basis, you know that Dave knows how to build those high-quality Warthog electric uh, setups back in the back of the shop. And you can upgrade that gear even further if you want by choosing Spike or Blickman kettles on uh, HighGravityBrew.com. 
you can use that build your own brewing system feature on highgravitybrew.com. I'm dang happy with my Bayou Classic kettle on my Warthog Electric Brew in a Bag system, but you may have better taste. <laughs> Whatever your brewing style or needs, a Warthog Electric Brewing System from HighGravityBrew.com will take the pain out of propane. Use the code EBC75BB on HighGravityBrew.com to save 75 bucks off your Warthog Electric Gear purchase. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. I've got packages of, of Huga for, uh, lager yeast from Imperial, and it's my turn to brew this time. Mm -hmm. Chris Colby and I uh, met earlier this week and came up with a recipe for a Vienna a Vienna lager. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had half a half a beer. <laughs> yeah, I'm already turn, I'm turning into Tom Brokaw all of a sudden. <laughs> a Vienna lager. Uh, but the uh so it's a super simple recipe we came up with. Seven and a half pounds of Vienna or or Vienna, as I used to say when I was a kid. We had, mm. we used to eat Vienna sausages. Uh, seven and a half pounds. Oh, of... yeah, Vienna wafers wasn't that a thing. <laughs> yeah, or fingers. Yeah, Vi yeah, yeah, Vienna f fingers. Yeah, those are good. That's a good. Isn't that what's in a tiramisu? Uh, you could put those. Yeah, you could put those in there. They go good in milk. Boy, now I'm hungry for those. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have things like that in the house because they don't last very long in the house. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, seven and a half pounds of Vienna, two and a half pounds of light Munich. Uh, and two ounces of black malt or, you know, a dehusked black malt, maybe like black prince or something like that. Yeah, for color. That's the malt bill. Uh, two and a half ounces of Czech Sats mm -hmm. uh, at 60 minutes. And then that's it. And then with the uh, Huga. Um, and I'm not planning to make a, a starter with with my lagers. Uh, so I just I want to see. But I'm going to do that beer as a no chill. Ooh. Yeah, uh, because there are no hops at the end of the boil. Right. And I'm just going to, you know, like, you know, rack into my no chill container and then either set it outside if it's cold mm -hmm. or, you know, put it in the basement and chill it down and then f ferment that one in the uh, the uh, kegerator because I can control the temperature and there's nothing in there right now. Mm. And this beer, the beer that we're going to formulate today, I'm going fer to ferment in the basement, which is a little warmer it's probably maybe 59 degrees Fahrenheit or something okay. like that, around maybe 60. Uh, it's been a little warm here lately. But mm. but I want to, you know, kind of like compare. They're different beers. It's going to be a different recipe. So it's yeah. not, you know, yeah. like 100%. It's not like a Brewlosophy Triangle experiment or something. But Right, right. Uh, uh, so I want to, I you know, kind of see how the yeast acts in both of those situations. Uh, and like I say, I'm not going to make a starter with these lagers because I I did make a starter one time, a two liter starter, with one of Imperial's uh, lager yeasts, and I put it on the stir plate. I dusted it off. I put it on the stir plate, mm -hmm. and uh, I came back maybe an hour later. I don't know, just a you know, not too long later, just to make sure that the the uh, stir bar didn't come loose from the magnet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was like coming out of the top of the Erlenmeyer flask. <laughs> it was like, wow. wow. <laughs> and so, you know, I hunted my firm cap ass down and put some drops in there and slowed down the stir, pl the, uh, stir plate. And, and um, I was like, do I really need to make a starter? <laughs> yeah. So, so the next lager I made, I didn't make a starter. You know, it was a moderate gravity five-gallon uh, batch. But, you know, I didn't I didn't make a starter and it came out fine. It, it was slower starting than an ale, a typical ale, mm -hmm. but it was it was fine. You know, it tasted it tasted just fine. So I'm just it, or at least on the first batch I brew, I'm going to see, you know, how that pitch goes. And if it's a little slow to start or if it seems like it's struggling, then I'll make a starter for the second batch. But so what's the style that you want to talk about today? What's the style that you want to uh, formulate today. I would love to do an Italian Pilsner. <laughs> now, why, Matt Giovannisi, uh -huh. why would you, <laughs> why do you want to make an Italian Pilsner? Because everybody wants me to uh, make an uh, Italian Pilsner. <laughs> they just want me to do it. I, they think I have to do it. It's like when they meet me, they're like, oh, so you like spaghetti? I'm like, what? Why is that? Why is that automatic? I mean, yeah, of course, but. You're out jumping on mushrooms, climbing down pipes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> like, oh, what are you, a plumber? I'm like, uh, no. I don't, no. Why? Should I be? Wait, what's going on? No, yeah, I I, I, <laughs> I just said, I said, yeah, to you. Uh, I No, I really like, I love, uh, I love them. I mean, I've been, um, the first example I ever had was Pivo pills from Firestone Walker. Um, and I didn't realize that that was an Italian. I mean, Italian pills didn't really like come into my world as a style until maybe like a year or two ago. Hmm. Um, you know, just Pilsner, Pilsner's Pilsner. It's a German pills. But Italian pills, I, I, from everything, you know, there's not really much online about it because uh, it's not a BJCP style. But I think essentially it's a dry hopped German Pilsner. Yeah. And, and dry hopping you can do. And I've seen there's another uh, uh, one I told you about that I really like. Uh, it's it's called Big Big Spill Pills out of Arizona. I think Ren, Ren Brewing Company. And that beer was really good. But it was very um, reminiscent of. I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. But like, you remember brood IPAs? Oh yeah. So kind of in that like new world hop, uh, dry hopping, right? And I, that's okay. I think that's fine. Um, but I still like traditional pilsners as a, you know, as this, as like, this my, it's one of my favorite beers. And, I like the idea of dry hopping a, a Pilsner mm -hmm. and you can do it with new world hops, but I think it's a little more interesting to do it with noble traditional hops that you would do in a, you know, it's like, again, taking a German Pilsner and then, you know, brewing it normally, but then dry hopping with some more hops. Yeah. And, and aggressively. So yes. Yeah. And, so, and we got to say that, you know, Moretti and Peroni are Italian pilsners, <laughs> but that's not. What I mean, yeah, oh. that's, that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> no, but I do love a Peroni. <laughs> I do. I, there's a there's a there's a pizza place that opened down the street from me and they have it on tap. And I don't care. I'm just drinking the heck out of those. I feel like I need to. Again, <laughs> I walk in. They're like, what do you want? Uh, uh, you want a Peroni? I'm like, wait, how'd you how'd you know? <laughs> Like, like you're wearing a red hat with an M on it. <laughs> <laughs> you're carrying a mushroom. I don't. I, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Uh, it's it's still safe to ma to make fun of Italians, right? It, it is, and it's, and I am one. So what are you going to do? <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, For, forgive is, us, Tony. Is... Forgive us, our friend Tony Monzi. Forgive us, Tony. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I. I. You know. I. I. But I do really love the style, and I just. Uh. You know. And introduced it to my dad over the Christmas break. Um, he's not a real hoppy, you know, beer drinker, but he's a Pilsner drinker. And I think this was like a perfect balance of like, yes, it's hoppy, but it's still a Pilsner to me. Mm. So that's that's a good I think that's a good balance. So let, let's start talking about ingredients. Um, just traditional uh, German Pilsner. It seems like this is going to be another uh, maybe simple malt bill. Absolutely. Yeah, I would go. Yeah, and I can start building the recipe as we as we talk. Yeah, um, and remind yeah. us what what app you're using. So I'm using an app called Brew Father. Um, I do I do love it. And you've and you've got my uh, water profile in there. I have your water profile. I have your uh, I have your system. So I'm going to add that in. Basic brewing Italian Pilsner. I'm not going to get fancy with the name. I mean, I guess I could call it a Givenchy Pilsner, and that would fit. <laughs> that, I'm I'm open. All right. Um, and yeah, the style, if we're going to like go to any sort of style, it's yeah, I'll just go with a German Pilsner because that's essentially, you know, I think. And again, anybody out there can correct me if I'm wrong about this in any sort of way, but that's essentially what it is. Just dry hopped. Yeah. From everything I've read and from everything I've tasted, I'm like, <laughs> this tastes no different than a Pilsner. Just there's more hops in it, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think we need to start with a traditional and and being very specific to choose a German Pilsner malt. Okay. Um, so I, I I'm assuming at that point we're looking at uh, I guess Weirmans like maybe a Barca Pils. Yeah, I'll have to check with the local homebrew store if you can get it. I think at this yeah. point, you know, I'm going to put it in there as that, but we're just going to go uh, ten pounds and we'll see where it gets us. But I would I would try to go, you know, hey, if you can get an Italian uh, 
Pilsner. I don't, I don't know if they, if gonna, they make any I'm gonna, malt. I'm, I'm going to do a quick search here. Avant-garde Pilsen malt. Mm. Avant-garde Pilsner malt is made from the finest two row spring bars uh, grown in the most prominent regions of Germany, France, Denmark, and England. Well, there you go. That's so there you go. All right. That's, that's what I'm going to put in. Okay. It does have it here. There you go. Uh, it doesn't. Ch- it actually does change. Interesting. I put the wiremans in. Changing nothing, by the way. <laughs> that was that came out to four point nine percent ABV. Put in this uh, uh, Avangard, five percent. Oh, so I guess it's got a little bit more diastatic power, or maybe okay. a little more girthy. I don't know. A little maybe a little fatter, fatter yeah. kernels. <laughs> so I would ask you. What per because since we're only putting one malt in, yeah, uh, you know, the style calls for between 4.4 percent and 5.2. Do you want a do you want a boozier pilsner or more of a kind of like sessionable? <laughs> well, <laughs> well yeah. earlier You're in the year, I would have said more sessionable. It's going to be a different year for me, more so, of course. I, I don't know if we get hit, you know, like right at five percent, that'd that's be good. all right. right. So that's 12 pounds of this stuff. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and doing a six gallon batch is what I have it set out here. This is what you normally do. Uh, the, going into the fermenter, yeah. Okay. And then a mash efficiency at around 70%. Probably. Yeah. yeah. For, for uh, my, big, my big system. Yeah. Um, so uh, now that now yeast you already have picked out, is that correct? Yeah. The Huga. The now, L- it's probably not in here, right? L25 Huga, H Y G G E. It's a uh, seasonal. Okay, so what do you think? So uh, that yeast, like, how is that yeast different, and what makes it seasonal, and as opposed to say something like harvest? It's a Northern European lager yeast, famously used in pilsner style beers that complement significant hop additions. There you go. Very clean and crisp with a very light sulfur profile. So uh, this is the beer for that. Uh, so that sounds so good. What? Uh, all right, so I have to add some <laughs> lager yeast in there. I'm gonna go. Maybe with Urkel? No, that's, that's, that's check. <laughs> Maybe. What was the catchphrase? Did I do that? Was Did that? I do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I used to have one of those. I used to have a doll that had a pull string, <laughs> and it was a it was a Steve Urkel doll, <laughs> and it had a pull string. And it would do all his catchphrases. <laughs> <laughs> was there more than one? I don't know. I never watched that yeah, show. Uh, did I do that? And like, oh, does anyone like any cheese? <laughs> Something like that. Um, you, had a, you had a couple, you know. Or I didn't um, do it. No, that's Bart. That's Bart Simpson. Uh, yeah. I didn't do it. Uh, I guess I'll go. I don't know. I'm just going to pick it because I, I don't have this yeast in here, and I don't think it really matters. So I'm going to go with uh, – I'm going to go with Global. Okay. We'll just stick that in there. I don't think it does. It does not going to change anything. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, yeah. now yeah, with ahead. the, does this, in, is it just the dry hopping that's different or do we increase the bitterness? Is the, is it more bitter than a standard like German Pilsner? So uh, Pivo, which is the, the one from Firestone clocks in at 40 IBUs. Ooh. Um, and, but the majority of the hops come from aroma hops added in the last 30 minutes of the boil. Last thirty minutes. Huh. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um. So maybe we just do the hop addition at thirty minutes instead of sixty. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, we we I think we shouldn't. We should push the hops as late as possible, but we still want it to be bitter, right? We still want it to have that pills bite, right? I think, but but I think thirty minutes is fine. Yeah, as long as you should. adjust, and this software will do that. Adjust the IBUs uh, for that that timing. Yeah, and and I think we could go with uh, so as far as like hops are concerned, I think honestly the sky's the limit. Um, but I do like the idea of going with a traditional German, um, you know, noble hop. Sure, I think that's super fun. Now, of all four, <laughs> one being Czech, I think, right? Um, yeah, we they've got uh, Hallertau tradition. Yep. Uh, they've got Hollertau uh, Middlefru. That's the tradi- that's the noble, yeah. They've got Hollertau Blanc, but we don't want that. That's going to be no a fancier. Uh, let's go with Hollertauer. Okay. I, I don't know. I like it. 
Middle fruit uh, or a tradition? Middle fruit, yeah, yeah, Mung okay. middle fruit. So um, what, let's do uh, only a 30-minute edition and see where we can get. Let's see. Let's get up to about 30 IBUs. So that would require, so three ounces, because this is only a 4.5% uh, IBU or, or uh, alpha acid. That gets us to 33 okay. IBUs if we add three ounces at 30 minutes. Now, we could stagger it where we do maybe two ounces at 30 minutes, two ounces at flame out, and then maybe two ounces in the dry hop and see, you know, that, we'll see where that gets us. I, you know, I, I would rather just do like the bittering charge at 30 minutes yep. and then just do the dry hop. Okay. Just to, you know, just to see what happens. Yep. I That's like just it. me, though. <laughs> and it's my beer. <laughs> yep, yep. So we're going to do, uh, I'm just going to keep the dry hop at the exact same ounces, three ounces. That might be a little overkill, but. Yeah, um, that's what it's and, all about. And so, yeah, let's just do that. I think it's it's three ounces of a, uh, three ounces of hops at 30 minutes and three ounces dry hop. Yeah. Make it even. And we got the yeast. So the only thing we need is, uh, just for ingredients purposes, is water profile. Are you messing with water in this at all? I will. You will. Yes. People right. keep emailing me saying, it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> all right. So I got James Spencer's home uh, as, as, the, as the source. And that brings us in. It's not, not too far off of my source. Um, and so we need to pick a target profile. And, you know, we could, in this one, if we wanted to, we could go with an, an American lager. We could probably go with a pills in light lager, which I think you got to do. Yeah, I think you got to do that. Okay. Which means you're not, you're probably not going to be adding too much. Or anything. Actually, you're not adding anything. Oh, I like that. Literally, <laughs> the, yep, you have the perfect water. <laughs> For a pills and light lager. Yay. <laughs> but you're you know, uh according to the software, and who knows where we are, but uh your water pH you may need your your mash pH you may need to adjust. But uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Save to recipe, it saves nothing because your water's already perfect. Yay. Uh, there you go. So super simple. <laughs> and um as far as a mash profile, mm -hmm. I, again, I don't I, you know. I don't think we need to do anything crazy. You know, you can do step mashes in your system. Oh, yeah. You know. Super easy. I don't I don't think we need to do that. I think we just stick at a sack rest of 150 for 60 minutes, call it a day. Yeah. Or right? or I'll just watch my refractometer, and when it stops climbing, that's when I'll yeah. stop. Yeah. Usually and, it's and, like 70, around 70 minutes. And um, and at this point, we're, we're in the, the range for all of those things for a German Pilsner. Oh. Without really doing all that much. Awesome. So the re the real difference here is that three ounce of dry hop, like dry hopping with noble hops. I love that idea. Yeah, I'm really yeah. curious to see. I need to go back and listen to the hop sampler series where Steve and I tasted ooh this hop because I'm sure it's out there. And I'm assuming that uh, what I'll, what I'll do is I will ferment in my sort of. Uh, either in a bucket or this this conical plastic fermenter thing that I'm not real happy with, so I'm not going to say the name. I got you. Uh, but it's easy to dry hop in because you can take the lid off and you know put the put the bag in there and and close it and and see what's going on. Right. With a bucket, it's kind of hard, you know, because I like to actually see what's going on. Yeah, it is nice. Um, so I'll I'll probably use that and with a bag. Uh, and go in just as the – well, I might do it in coinciding with my diacetyl rest because since we're talking about loggers, we have to – and we did this with – I did this with Chris, but mm -hmm. we have to reiterate that it is – it is it, whatever temperature – you know, the lower you go, the more important it is that you do – that you warm up the beer – as it's nearing the end of the fermentation, as the yeast is still in suspension, as it's finishing up its job, right. so that it has the energy and the whatever that happens to clean up in itself there, to clean right. up the buttery butterscotchy character of of the beer. 
So maybe I'll just I'll dry hop during the diacetyl rest. I'll kill two birds with uh, one stone. Yeah, the, the 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 fermentation control is probably going to be the most important aspect of this. Uh, if you want that like super clean, it it, it should have a little uh, sulfur note, mm. but which I love. If I'm being honest, that's like my favorite. I like that note. I don't know why. It's like going to the gas station. You know, like sometimes they. <laughs> I like that aroma. I don't know why. <laughs> you're not is that just huff, me? You're not huffing <laughs> gas, are you? No, I'm not. No, I mean, not at, not at large quantities. No, of course not. But <laughs> I can't be the only one that likes the smell of a gas station. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, but not the urinal cake. No, 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 no. Not the smell of a gas station bathroom or even gas station sushi. Just the <laughs> gas station. <laughs> you know, you could, uh, we could, you know, mash a little lower. Uh, it's like everything's kind of like you know it 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 seems like it could be even like oh this one of my favorite versions of italian pills is very local to me mm. and it's called uh it's just called westbound italian pills which is a a brewery here i love it it's like cr it's crispy and it is hoppy mm. and i could just it's like it's uh, it's like the best pilsner ever, but it's an Italian pills. They call it Italian pills. Oh. And I and I love it. They used and they use a lot of like I mean, it's a kind of a in a lot of these recipes, too, when you look at them, it, it is sort of a, a combination of of Czech and German pilsner. Like it's it's you know, I've seen nothing about doing any sort of decoction. All the beers that I've had in this style have been like very light, mm. you know, not, not, you know, in the sense of like, uh, when you think of like Pilsner or Kell, right. nothing decocted, it, nothing like malty. Um, they've all been super light. I, I've had, I've had versions where they were a little bit more malty, but it seems they use like maybe a Munich malt or something. They're not, they're not decocting at this style, but, uh, yeah, a lot of them just have like a high IBU and it's, you know, really, it's really about the hops at this point. The only thing I think that we could maybe mess with mm. is the hops. Is really the hops. Uh, you I know, I want to be fancy though. I want to. I want to keep. I want to. You know, we've done. I've done. You know, big. You know, I've got the. Uh, you know, the bells too hearted clone that I've done in multiple yeah. occasions, just because I love it so much. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, but those are. That, you know, that's that's uh, centennial. Um, yeah. And lots of it. Super cascade. Uh, yes. And, but I, but I, I like the idea of doing a, a noble hop dry, super, you know, like five, three ounces in a, a in a little Pilsner is, that's a lot. I mean, it's only four and a half percent alpha acid, but you know what we just created? Mm. A smash beer. Oh, yes. You know, it's just Pilsner and Holotower. I love it. I always like to start recipes that way where you go. Not 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 always a smash, right? Because you can't always do a smash beer. Like, you know, you wouldn't do a smash stout that doesn't exist, right? <laughs> that would be horrible. Uh, but I do think starting with a very simple two to three grain, you know, one to two hops, which which you know, it it in recipe development in general, like you know, with cooking and stuff, it's like you can taste those ingredients. Yes, and you go okay. This needs a little more of this, or this. Oh, this could use some lemon, or this could use some this. That's when you can start to. It, it becomes a great place to build off of. Mm -hmm. And and even when I was doing my, you know, three years of developing a hazy IPA, I started with you know really just a base grain bill, a base one one hop, and then it's like as you do it, it's like okay, this is missing this, or like I'm trying to get this uh, flavor, or I'm trying to get this even this mouthfeel or like this, uh, the sensation that I want in, a, in this recipe, how do I achieve that sensation on top of what I've already built? Right. I, I and that's, I love that in, you know, even like if, if you're making bread, I mean, bread is like the simplest of ingredients, you know, it's like the simplest food ever, right? It's right. three ingredients essentially. Right. And, but what's interesting is you could start to mix and match different wheats and different flours and it starts to get more complex mm -hmm. and depending on how old the yeast is and where it comes from and how you've developed it over the year. It's like the simple ingredients with a great process 
And then you can build on top of that and add things on top of it. Like, oh, I want, I wish this bread had a little spice in it. Maybe you can add some rye and kind of make, you know, you, you, you can, I think it's like you have that base palette. It's, you know what it is? It's like uh, Bob Ross, right? <laughs> because you get a little happy little to, tree. He has to start with the wet on wet, right? He, yeah. he, he paints the whole canvas with, you know, I think white paint. Makes it easier from the paint, but he's got to start with something, mm -hmm. not just a blank canvas. It's there's something there. There's something on the canvas. And then you just kind of add and add and add layers and layers without well, getting too crazy. Well, OK. And, and one last thing, one last uh, uh, reference, and then we'll we'll we'll, mm -hmm. we'll cut it off. But but it's like spaghetti sauce. <laughs> to bring Wait, it back why? around sure yeah because right. i when i when i sometimes when i make spaghetti sauce it's like what leftovers do we have and the, these carrots are are getting a oh, little yeah. rubbery i'll mm -hmm. put those in there you know mm -hmm. we got the we start with the canned tomatoes you know we got the you know the italian seasoning maybe mm -hmm. if it's the right time of year we got some basil from the garden we maybe have mm -hmm. some oregano from the garden mm -hmm. but then there's some you know red wine and then there's right. uh, then there's some italian sauce then there's this you know like this uh this uh, this polish sausage that i have in the you know right. and, the, and then there's this leftover chicken you know and then sometimes it turns out good other times it's a mess and i yeah. have to talk, I, I ask susan is this good right right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then other times I'll actually follow a recipe that's just like tomatoes, mm -hmm. onions, olive mm -hmm. oil, a little garlic, a little spice, yeah, that, and that's it. And it's just so like this is so much. Sometimes my crazy everything you know Mulligan stew uh, pasta sauce is is not the best. Right. Sometimes right. I is like, man, you know, this this combination of ingredients knocks it out of the park. Other times it's like, Ugh, what is it? Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I, you know, you're right. And I do think that as human beings, we and I we've probably said this on a previous show, and I'm sure you've said it over many years. <laughs> it's it's that we overcomplicate things. Yes. You know, it's like, oh, we're making beer. It's really one of the simplest foods of all time, right? Mm -hmm. It's like literally four ingredients to start. Uh but yeah, you you overcomplicate it because you want to feel and you want to you think it's it's a bigger deal than it is. And then you go back to bread even and bread and beer, you know, obviously very similar. You know, one's three ingredients. Technically, the other one is also three ingredients. If you don't count <laughs> yeast, if we don't understand it yet. Uh, but those things, it's like so simple, it's such mm -hmm. a simple thing. And if you can make the simple thing amazing. Well, then you, I mean, like, then the sky's the limit, right? Because then anything you add on top, yeah, to an extent, will be an an added bonus as long as it's done with intention. I think. Yeah. You know. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, you can find uh, you can find Matt Giovanisi on uh, on brewcabin dot com where he has uh, uh, beer brewing courses mm -hmm. and also the uh, Brew Cabin YouTube uh, channel. And if you got a swimming pool or a uh, a hot tub, <laughs> Swim University is the thing that you must uh, get involved in because yeah. you're prolific with those. I mean, you know, I'm too intimidated to. You think I'm intimidated with you know water chemistry with my right. beer? Yeah, Jeez yeah, Louise. yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Swim University. Uh, I assume dot com and the YouTube mm -hmm. channel as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, <laughs> If you got a pool, I guess. <laughs> you can drink beer in a pool, you know? Yeah. It's not sure. safe, but you could do it. <laughs> disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer, of course, yes. Well, I hope you I hope that you're getting as much out of these conversations that I am because uh I it's just a blast to to get together with you and and uh, yeah. to to talk and it's just fun to to chat and then, you know, the fact that we're recording this and and putting it out for other people to listen to. I hope everybody is getting as much fun and useful information uh, as I am uh, with this uh, with this relationship because uh, it's just I'm I'm having a blast. I love talking about beer with you. This is awesome. I you know I could do this all day. I could literally <laughs> could talk all day. <laughs> and, and we may we've still got some beer. I've still yeah, got some beer. In my, after we put the stop button, we uh -huh. may be. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got all day. <laughs> Now I can't get can't go anywhere. I can't drive. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, stuck here. All right. Well, look look forward to uh, to getting some bottles from me. Yeah. Oh, 
And an Italian pills? Mm-hmm. I might throw anyway. in some Vienna lager in there too. <gasps> Ooh. Another <laughs> another fave. Yeah, I'm, I'm all I'm all in. All right. Thanks, Matt. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks again to Matt. We did continue our conversation. <laughs> Probably too long. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And uh, the triple was way good, which contributed to the length of the conversation, I'm sure. I'll keep you posted on the progress of the Italian Pilsner. I think it's going to be delicious. Uh, a little bit of pressure there since, you know, Matt has sent me, you know, two really good beers. I sent him that, you know, I was I was okay with the, uh, uh, the Belgian wit that I sent him. But uh, I, I'm thinking that this one's going to be really good. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website, is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.